we need to deconstruct. And yet every society did it wrong. We all did it wrong. Uh, capitalism, it's wonderful that you can get a safety pin at 4 a.m. within a half mile of anywhere in the United States. And I'm sure the Russians uh, wish they had it so good. But is that the uh, be-all and the end-all of cultural values, that you can walk the flore fluorescent-lit uh, aisles of Kmart and congratulate yourself that whether it be gas can, sanitary napkin, or whatever, it's there waiting for you. I don't think so. I think that we have built in the termination of our world just as surely as the Marxist world built in a tripwire into its social mechanism. It's just that we're going to have to pay the piper short, more downstream in a while. What's happening globally is that the contradictions of all of these social systems are rising into evidence. I mean, we have lethal ideas. The world is haunted by a number of lethal ideas. Uh, the hot lethal idea at the moment is crack and you know we're exhorted it's terrible 11 year old children are apparently uh, the sole source of support for a 14 billion dollar industry civilization is going over the edge um, as a former member of the high church of rome i feel it's incumbent upon me to point out to you that the the policies of the papacy on population are shoving more people into early death, disease, and degradation than any drug scourge you could imagine. And I haven't heard any call for the extradition of the Pope. So, uh, you know, it's just a matter of cultural style and blindness, uh, uh, where you think the suffering is coming from and who you think is responsible for it. If we descend into the dominator metaphor and play its game, we're probably going to be snookered because they've had a long, long time to figure out all the angles. What I find myself more and more leaning to is uh, sharing the meme of the irrelevance of conservative institutions. History is not a process for which you ask permission. History is just something you make and then other people pick up the pieces. Henry David Thoreau understood this very well when he wrote his uh, famous treatise on civil disobedience. Um, the growth of culture is something that comes out of the animal body Rousseau called it the general will. Uh, you know, man proposes and God disposes. But in the realm of civil polity, the people propose, the people dispose, and government is allowed to propose. But that's all. And now what we are involved in really is a debate about human nature. Who are we? What are we? Uh, the French cartoonist Mobius put it very well in his book where he asked the question, is man good? This is what we're going to find out. And I, my feeling is that it isn't decided yet. That it, it is, uh, you know, H.G. Wells called history a race between education and disaster. Well, you know, they're in the home stretch, neck and neck. It's clearly going to be a photo finish. But there is a, a responsibility on everyone who sees this to communicate it to other people and to act upon it. I, I think we forget, we, all of us, what a tiny percentage of the human race we represent and how many people are um, just so lost in propaganda and unexamined cultural values. And, you know, people are worrying about how to get the next $600 end table or 
you know, just trivia. And yet the world rolls inexorably toward a confrontation uh, with transformation or ruin. How can the, the word be spread without just spreading panic? Well, I think it has to do with empowering this notion of a, a planetary process, a Gaian birth that we are midwife to, which is a functional role, but not a central role. The process is going to happen. Our job is to ease it, to reassure the mother, reassure the spectators, help the child, bring everything to a calm fruition. But we are ultimately witnesses to the process, not its cause. And in the, in the ethics of the position of witness, we can find, I think, uh, a place to stand that will allow us to feel responsible and exercise moral responsibility without feeling paralyzed by the magnitude of the task. Things are getting better and better in every way. I mean, uh, it's a complex process because the world lives through death. I mean, you can see, if you're an embryologist, that when the, when the little paddle of the fish human in the fetus begins to change into a hand the way in which it the way in which the fetus develops is through the sculpting hand of death death carves away tissue cells are shed into the amniotic fluid they die and out of this process of inward dying the undifferentiated fish-like fetus turns into a miniature anticipation of a human being. There is something totally consuming about the way nature builds life out of death. The Amazon is a wonderful example of this because the Amazon is the most living place you have ever seen. And at any given moment, all organic material is bound in living systems, 95% bound in living systems. You don't find forest floor detritus and rotting logs and stuff like that in the Amazon. If a leaf falls within minutes or hours at most, it has been found by leaf cutter ants or some other pathogen that uh, begins to return it to the cycle of life. This kind of economy, this kind of stability through utilization of flow is the design principle that we have ignored for several thousand years and that uh, offers a way out. Dynamic equilibrium, an abandonment of the possibility of closure. Closure is a neurotic and infantile demand to make upon reality, other people, language. Uh, you just have to live in this state of dynamic disequilibrium, which if sustained long enough and in sufficient taste, becomes a life well lived. The shaman knows this because they plunge into this realm where everything is transient flow and interlocking field, where the materiality of the uh, ordinary reality is overcome by the quantum mechanical, wave mechanical, maternal face behind appearances. And again, you know, it must be Moby Dick morning. Uh, Ahab says, if you would strike, strike through the mask. It is behind the mask. Reality is a mask because reality enforces this idea of permanence but not if carefully examined. Women know this because women see birth, bury the dead, raise the children. They exist in this domain of flow, but the male dominant ego 
because it is transient and has great anxiety about that, refuses this primary intuition. And when I say that the original partnership society was stabilized through um, uh, boundary dissolution, that's what I mean. The dissolution of the assumption of permanence. Me, my existence, my women, my food, my children, my weapons, my land, my this, my that, you know, all of that is seen as a fiction. That's why primitive people are so amused by us and our concerns and our clutching because they know easy come, easy go. And uh, if we could learn this one thing, this is what the plants are trying to teach, I think, that the border between life and death, between being and not being, between me being me and me being you, is so trivial and so arbitrary that uh, it can only be seen as the the outer iridescence on the real reality within. This is the secret of, uh, of a happy life, I think. I mean, I certainly don't claim to achieve it. I am fraught with the agonvite of inwit and the torments of uh, the 42-year-old Irish male, California, heavily mortgaged soul. But, uh, but, this, but I saw it. I saw it. I saw what it was. And what it is, is it's a coming to terms with impermanence. And that gives you authenticity that nothing can take away. And courage and presence in the moment and humor and uh, survivability. Survivability. And if you hold instead to the inviolate pearl of that which cannot be destroyed, uh, everything becomes your enemy. Time becomes your enemy. Space becomes your enemy. And you are uh, doomed to that Ahab fate because, hey, it's bigger than any of us. Uh, you can't push the river. Well, that's just by way of summation trying to say, you know, what is it the pith essence of shamanism aside from the colorful cultural forms, the dances, the feats of curing and leisure domain. Uh, essentially, it all rides, I think, on this vision that all things are impermanent, nothing lasts, all the things are in the process of coming to be and, uh, and passing away. Unto the last syllable of recorded time. Well, that was that. Um, Nicole, do you want to try your own summation? Or This afternoon I see basically as an opportunity for people to get their final questions answered. So if you want to make a, a, any kind of statement this morning, that would be fine. Well, I had planned, I rather wanted to, but it doesn't follow. It doesn't matter. It, to, to discuss some of the medicinal plants that are available in the jungle, that are disappearing as we cut and slash and burn, and that can do so much if only they are so people will go after them and bring them in, test them, and put the, and discover how best to use them. Well, I think you should do that. I think it's good to go from the general to the specific. Hmm? Yeah, go for it. Well, there is. I've mentioned several of them, but I've had some peculiar experiences myself because, in the first place, it's very difficult when you have only anecdotal reports or information on plants. You don't know quite what to believe. People exaggerate, and people get a little bit imaginative because it makes themselves more important. And then, too, I, I'm peculiarly subject to that because I haven't gone after things that have been medically tested, scientifically investigated. I've gone after what isn't known. 
because, well, the others there, let, let the technicians take over, but the other stuff, the stuff I've been after, is still in the minds and customs of people who are rapidly disappearing and who are, la- and who are losing that knowledge and the knowledge that's kept them alive and remarkably healthy through we don't know how many millennia. So I thought that's what I want. Now to find out how much of it is a highly elaborated report is about one of the hard, the two hardest things are to check diagnosis, which you just about can't do, and to, to check the truth of the reports of cures. Because there are, we know of course that everything from aspirin to, to cocaine came originally from plants. But how many of them are just analogs of what we have? How many of the things that I learn about are merely analogs of things we already have more conveniently available from pharmaceutical outfits? And how many do not do the things they are supposed to claim to do? And how many are real? And they're there for us and we need them badly and can do things that we can't do without, well, surgery, like the burn remedies, that even with a great deal of plastic surgery can't really be equaled in their efficiency. So the first thing I've done always is get, if it's in the tribe, that's easier because you can ask different people different questions that are really the same question but asked in different ways about did he have white stuff on it you got it of course you say it was infected they have the remotest idea what you're talking about but did it have a lot of white goo I'm still on the subject of burns a lot like uh, like the sap of the capinuri on it well that's pretty apt to be pus and it's pretty apt to be and pus means infection you go about it that way it's a very long and tiresome process and then you get it from one person then you have to get it from another and then another and another and some of them will say well it wasn't much and some of them will say so you do you do the best you can and set it aside as something that must be investigated uh, like I've been particularly interested in burns because it seems to me such a horrible thing to be terribly disfigured. And I noticed that uh, you almost never see anything like that in the jungle. And yet they have a lot of fire problems. I mean, they, in the first place, they clear their land by slash and burning, and somebody's kids quite frequently falling into something that's on fire. Or the fire in many areas are made, a stove is mud with, held together by four logs and the fire is built on that and the fire turns, the, it's very clayey soil almost everywhere in the Amazon and that turns to adobe and it makes a good hard surface to build a fire on. Well, we were go- I was going up the Napo with Norman um, Farnsworth, who is our leading pharmacognosist, and a bunch of other scientists I was taking up to, sh- to a Witoto outfit, that friends of mine, because they wanted a jungle expedition. And uh, we stopped to pick up a friend of mine who is a, one of the most knowledgeable people I know, in the area of medicinal plants and he's a, gen- a Peruvian gentleman who married well he had a wife in Lima but he sort of went jungle he had a charming wife in the jungle and we got there when his their six month old baby had just 
the day before crawled into the fire. The stove on the, on the earthen floor, the place they were living. And the child's arms, the ventral surface, from wrist to elbow, both arms, was completely without skin. It was raw red, meat red, meat. And uh, it's quite a pinkish red. And the two doctors, uh, the two MDs who were with us immediately said, oh, we'll take care of that. He said, no, you don't. They said, well, we'll do something to stop the pain. Let's at least put some some local anesthetics on it. He said, does the baby look as if it were in pain? And the baby was at that moment in the arms, had been picked up by one of the scientists, a former cognizant, who had a bright red beard. And the baby was laughing himself, saying, laughing and grabbing the beard with both hands. And they said, well, no, maybe it doesn't hurt them. And so the, my friend, Godoy, his name was, said, he, well, he would, uh, yes, he'd come along with us, he'd just put a dressing on the baby first, and his wife would keep the dressings going while he was gone. And he got a good old piece of yucca. You know, that is the staple food. It is mania, mania, it is cassava, it has all sorts of names, but it's a staple food, starch, of the jungle, the entire Amazon region. You find it everywhere from Colombia to through Paraguay down to Argentina, everywhere. And because it's a very suitable jungle crop, crop, it from the time it's planted, you have a harvest in six months. And it's ideal climate and soil for it. Well, he took a piece of that. He peeled it, and inside there is an inside the brown peeling. It's a tuber, like potato. There is a sort of slimy, the inner skin, you might call it. It's a bast of flim. But uh, so it, uh, he took that and put this. The inner part is gelatinous. He put that on the baby's arms and bandaged it with good, clean, white bandages. And we went on up the river. We were gone eight days exactly. When we came back, we dropped Godoy off of his house. We went in to see him. And the baby had grown perfect skin. There was one area, I measured it, one by two centimeters, where the skin had not yet completely grown back. The rest of it was perfect. You could not see at all where the, the burn had been. It was new, it was clean, it was perfect. No change in texture or color, no borders, no puckering, no anything. Now that is the most available of all possible medicines. Of course, you've got to be careful not to get... I think it would be a bad idea to use the one that's full of cyanide. Some, Strangely enough, some yucca has to be cooked to get rid of the cyanide in it, which is an integral part of it. And then that's the yucca brava, and it's the same species. I've never figured this out. I'm not a botanist. They sort of claim they can figure out why. But the, but it's well known which ones have the uh, poisonous principle and which ones are totally without it. And I would <laughs> want to be very sure I was the one without, I think. So that is one of two plants that I know that does exactly that same thing. Of course, this was a very young baby, a six-month-old, very healthy baby. But I assume, I haven't seen another case, the, the uh, method doesn't seem to be known, even to the tribes, in any of the tribes I'm familiar with. Now, that sort of thing could be investigated cheaply. Did you want to say something, doctor? Uh, that could be investigated so cheaply, so easily. Why doesn't somebody? I'm ready to go. How is that spelled? Y-U-C-A. 
It is the staple food of the cities and the jungle, everywhere except the mountains. It does not grow in, in cold climates. Hey, I'm, sure, I'm sure you could get it in the You can buy it in the Puerto Rican stores. In the far, in oh, the, yes. Yeah. You can buy it in all the stores. But I, you, want, you must get an image, a very young tuba. I was told by by my friend, Godoy. It has to be quite a young one. But it's available anywhere. Just make sure you don't get the one. I don't think... Doctor, yeah? Isn't it, isn't it the case that sometimes these, these kind of remedies uh, lose their efficacy when you take them out of the social, cultural, and, and psychological environment or milieu that they were used in? No, I haven't found that. Right? Because I've used several I did not believe on myself because I, uh, well, there wasn't anything else. But <laughs> you remember my knees? Yeah, I do remember. When the motorcycle hit me and Nikita, Terence and Dennis were there at the time. And I got out of it very well. And uh, the thing, uh, except that all the scabs healed up, but uh, my knees didn't never went back to normal size. They stayed swollen and they got worse and worse. And I just, and of course they hurt, but I, you can ignore things. I have a high th pain threshold. And uh, kept going until the left knee began to keep, fold up every now and then. I'd go lurching along like an old drunk. And that was embarrassing. So I went over to see some friends in near Pucapara, an American doctor with him. And he said this, uh-uh, I can't handle this. You've got some bad tendon damage in there. It needs surgery. And uh, I'm not a surgeon. You have to go to Lima. Well, I was not trusting any Peruvian surgeons at that particular time. I know one is very fine, but he's a neurosurgeon. And the state of medicine in that country is not the highest. And anyway, knees are very tricky. So I thought, well, why not try some of these kooky things that my Montarasis, my jungle men, my, the people who get plants for me, have suggested, because they kept saying, put capinuri on it, put capinuri. So I did, and that's very sticky sap of tree. And the tree is Curvisia nitida. It's a rubiaceae. And I put it on, and you're not supposed to get it wet. You're supposed to let it dry. Well, I don't know how you do that to your knees and still take a shower a couple of times a day, as you must do in that climate. And so I just put it on fresh each time, and pretty soon the pain stopped very quickly. I'd put it on, put a folded gauze over it with adhesive tape, and that was all. And they healed up perfectly, and they're still fine, and I have no problem, no pain, no swelling, no whatever. And it doesn't make sense. But I'm very glad it works. And then that, that to me, is fairly good proof that it works. I was preparing to go to the States for surgery because I was quite certain there was no use in doing this, but try it, try it. And so I've had several things w that worked like that. There is, for example, a thing that dissolves kidney stones. I haven't had kidney stones, but kidney stones and gallstones. Though they're not identical chemically, it works perfectly for both of them. And my doctor in Iquitos, when I was first there, I had a doctor who was born in Iquitos. He was a very good doctor. And he'd been educated in Argentina, I believe it was. And I had a hot gallbladder. I went to him. And he, after the, when he saw the x-rays, he said, Oh, gee, it's a shame. It's a pity you haven't got gallstones. If you had gallstones... We could just get rid of them like that, with 
such an, this plant, Chanka Piedra, they call it, which means, incidentally, Chanka is Quechua, that's the language of the, uh, of the Inca, for sp- smash, shatter. And Piedra, of course, is rock. And many times you'll find the names of things are quite indicative of their use, but the use has been forgotten. For example, amor seco. Seco means dry, and I doubt that there's anyone who doesn't know what amor means. And that's a contraceptive. (laughs) But it's not, it's only widely known by tribes. About five tribes I know use it. I know that the Yuka and the Kampa, the uh, Yawa and the Kampa, and the Shipibo, the Konibo, and the Piro all use it. So, well, anyway, I managed to get the... Well, actually, I healed the uh, gallbladder with the first medicine plant I'd ever had, which is Boldo, which has been... which is investigated, I think it was about 1920 or 30, no, 20, by Johns Hopkins, and was put on the market, officially. It just, but it doesn't come from the jungle, it comes from Chile. It goes only in Chile, oddly enough. makes a perfectly delicious tea, and it's great for gallbladder infections. But it doesn't dissolve stones, and the other really does. Because my, do- my doctor told me that he had had some... Uh, were, uh, in the neighborhood of, uh, of 100, I think it was 93 cases, that he had found it utterly successful in curing. And... Also, a man came to visit me from Germany. In Germany, they have a far more generous attitude toward medicinal plants. There is great interest that Germans are not known for being bad scientists. They're pretty good at their stuff, especially in pharmacology. But they are you. They allow the sale of medicinal plants and the prescription of them very freely. And this man had a store for plant medicines, and he w- he'd come to Peru to get another shipment of Chanca Pedra. He told me that he had had it for sale for one year. He used up all he had. And that he had asked the people who came to and bought it to give him reports on progress and on, on the, well, the final result. And uh, he had had 94% reports of perfect cures, and the other six were people who never came back to tell him. Now, that that is a plant that could be grown very easily in the United States. I understand that laser actually takes care of those things very well, but not at the present time. It's still quite a, very expensive. This stuff is a weed that grows everywhere very easily. You know it. And uh, d- just grow it in any sunny, warm place. California would be perfect. Where would you find um, seedlings for that? Could you buy those uh, from California? Well, you could. No, you can't buy it now. But these things, that's the point I'm making. These things must be brought in. They really need to be brought in. And s- incidentally, the capinuri does the same thing as in Syria. You know the tooth one? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that I first learned about from a policeman, a jungle policeman. The, the police of Peru used to be excellent. Times have changed a bit, I'm afraid. But the, the jungle police was composed of men who had grown up in that environment who knew their way around, knew what to do, knew how to track, knew all that. And and what's more, they usually took an Indian with them to to check their tracking because nobody can do it like the Indians. And they were going after an escaped murderer when he developed a frightful toothache. And he had a camper tracker with him. And the camper said, oh, that's all right, I'll fix it. And he went off and came back about ten minutes later with a leaf on which he had a little bit of uh, very sticky, gooey 
yellow-white substance, sap of a tree. And he said, now, and in his hand he had a piece of kapok, which grows in the jungle. And he said, you take a little piece of kapok, cotton is what, the, because I have no cotton there, didn't have any cotton there. Cotton does grow wild in Peru, but not there. And uh, he dipped it in. He said, now be very careful to put this in the cavity and don't let it touch another tooth. Because he said it will take the tooth out. And it will not, if, but if it hits the tooth next to it, it'll, healthy one, it'll take that out too. And so he put it in and it, he said, it just, the pain stopped immediately. He said, it just felt very, very cold. And in the next, during the next 30 days, the tooth gradually broke up and came out in little bits. He had no infection, no bleeding, no pain. But the tooth was gone. I had thought originally that this meant the roots went too. They don't. Because a dentist from Atlanta, Dr. Hodges, I've forgotten his first name, Ben Hodges, who's a really very good dentist there, came down and he was interested in this and he did a trip up the rivers examining people who had take, removed, because lots of the people, the mestizos and Indians know this, and lots of people had, had teeth out that way. And he examined some, many that had been done years before. There was never an infection. He couldn't figure out why, because the root's still there. But he found uh, no trouble at all. Now, that is a very handy way to get rid of a tooth. I'd much prefer it to a root canal. I tried it. It didn't work. But that was. But we had kept the stuff in the refrigerator for a week first. It apparently has to be used fresh. And I should imagine the only way to get it up for testing in the States would be by freezing, flash freezing. That ought, I should think, to bring it up without too much change. That Those are two of the more generally popular things. But there are others. What was the name of that? Uh, the, what, the sap from the production? It is Chlorophora tinctoria, C H L O R O P H O R I A, T I N C T O R I A. And it is, I think, a euphorbiaceae. Yeah. I'm fairly sure it is. But you can always find the family if you've got the genus. And uh, the, then another of the things that urgently needs development now is the treatment for hepatitis. That Dr. Walter Lewis and his wife, Dr. Memory Elvin Lewis, who is a very strong feminist and must be mentioned in all his work, have uh, found that uh, the roots, they have confirmed what is generally known in some populations there, that the roots of certain palm trees, there are two that we know about for sure, will take an, they, they make an infusion of them, you know, make a tea of it. Actually, they boil them a little while, that's a decoction, not an infusion. And uh, drink the the uh, the broth and that will very nicely do away with hepatitis and Dr. Lewis found it very efficient for hepatitis B as well as the more ordinary and easily treated types now that is the root of Euterpe edulis which is a palm tree and that is uh, they have found that the uh, Ashwa Indians who were visited by Dr. Lewis had were using and getting the same results with, because there's a lot of he hepatitis, another palm tree, Iriart, it's an Iriartia that's called Ponacasha. And uh, it, it, he suspects that most of the palms 
in that area, at least, the, vari- the species that grow there, the genia, genuses that grow there, genera that grow there, will do the same thing. That hasn't been tested. But he has found them, chem- he's a very good phytochemist, and he's found them chemically very similar. Now, those, there's no reason why those things can't be broken down chemically and, and tested. That because things like palm roots, Chanka Pieda, the one for her gallstones, is very easy, is very effective dried, and so are the palm roots. Those are sold in the market in Lima. They're very popular there because they've got to be quite well known. Then there, let's see, what other diseases? There, for eyes, I was going up Rio Tigre on my way far in, and a man, a settler, stood on, standing on the bank, jumped up and down, kept waving and waving, we pulled over to see what was the matter, and he, when we got close, I have never seen a more hideous pair of eyes. One of them was dripping pus and blood. The other was just swollen and had some pus in it. It wasn't running down his face. And they were in very bad shape. He had been cutting, clearing land. And he got some sawdust, uh, sawdust, sawgrass, whipped across his eyes, cutting the corneas which got very badly infected. Jungle's a great place for infections. Well, he, I offered him immediate. I had brought uh, pen, both penicillin and tetracycline ointments and also even old faithful yellow oxide of mercury in the last, you know, if you couldn't get anything else. And he'd had all of those he got them from a military base that was just up the river and from a trader who came along who had the yellow oxide of mercury. At the military base, he got the, um, the, the antibiotics. Well, they hadn't, the antibiotics had rather helped the eye that looked not quite so bad. The other one, nothing had helped. And so I didn't know what to do. And my boatman said, but look, amigo, you're standing on the remedy. And he was standing on some, it's a grass, and it grows about so high. And he said, you take this, and you pull it apart at the node, and then you run your fingernail down, and out will come one crystalline drop of sap, the juice of that grass. You put it in, Put two drops of that in each eye every morning and every night and we'll, we'll find you cured when we get back. And so the man thanked him and he said he would do it and I, you know, I never heard of that. <laughs> and uh, so sure enough, when we came back two weeks later, it was exactly two weeks to, he, I know because I had to pay the boatman by the way, he was jumping up and down and waving, and he was the happiest guy you ever saw. He said, my eye, look, look, look. Of well, one eye, I looked. I have seen more bloodshot eyes on people with a bad hangover. And the other one it was still a little inflamed, the one that had been so very bad. But there was no pus, no blood. The... It, it was obvious they, the treatment was a success and the infection was gone and the healing was progressing rapidly and well on its way the, the, on the, the right eye was no actually it was the left I was there uh, was perfect oh, not quite perfect but I mean it was except for being a bloodshot and the other one the sweat and yucca and everything grew there 
give us a very unhappy chicken, which went all the way back to Iquitos with us. And, uh, but you know, a chicken's a valuable gift in there because chickens are not native. So, when we got, got going again, I said, you told me you didn't know anything about plant medicines. How come? He said, well, I didn't know it would cure that. <laughs> but I thought it would because it cured me of Carnosidad and if it'll cure Carnosidad, it'll cure anything. And Carnosidad is what they call pterygium, which is very common in tropical countries. It is actually, technically, I'm told, it's a benign tumor that begins at the tear duct and gradually spreads. It's a th- makes a layer about a millimeter thick and until it covers the whole eye and you're blind. It is, people who can afford it can have it removed by surgery, which is expensive and in Peru very frequently means the loss of an eye. But if you don't have radiation afterwards, it'll be back in a couple of years and you have to go through it all again. And so my boatman, whose name is Natividad, told me that he had had pterygium, he'd had carnosidad so badly that he was beginning not to be able to see. And he went to an old, he was living in Brazil, and an old woman there told him to use this treatment. He said it took him two months. But look at him now, well, look at him now. He didn't have a trace of anything wrong with his eyes. It had cleared it and cured it. Well, that, I think, might, just might, in many cases, do away with the need for corneal transplants if it's the right kind of injury. What do you think, Doctor? I think if you found a a cure for pterygia, a, a permanent cure for pterygia, you Oh, I know two or three. Well, I know two or three. They, the Indians use them. And uh, there, there is a, a cypress, a, which is a sedge, but it, it's a scleria. That there is, but it takes, those things take a long time. The, the, for pterygium, that the treatments must be given every day. It doesn't hurt. In fact, the, book, the the man on the shore told me that uh, it had felt very cooling when he put it in, very soothing. And uh, it, that takes two months for pterygium. Six weeks to two months. Every day treatment. But in the case of infection, it seems to work very much more rapidly. Yes? Uh, please interrupt me any time to ask a question. I like it. Nicole, uh, I heard a story about you from a reliable source a few years ago that uh, told me that, that uh, you, you had gone from village to village and managed to kind of meet the old women in the village who had knowledge of their... Um, their uh, uh, Contraceptive, the contraceptive uh, herbology. Yes. And that uh, you had found out about different herbs that had very different kinds of effects. Like I remember she was telling me one herb you could take it and a couple of years later it would, it would keep the woman infertile for two years. Yes. Another one, if they took it, it would be irreversible for a long time. And I've never heard you talk about it. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about her. Well, there is a number of them. You see, although... The, the uh, these people have been using oral contraceptives since time imm- immemorial. Nobody knows how many centuries. We found we still put got them into circulation in 1960. And uh, but before the earlier 1920, when Carstens wrote an article about it, 
uh, they called him a li- c- crazy or a liar or something because they said nothing taken by mouth can cause a woman to become sterile. Well, if time has moved on and the Indians were right. So uh, there are a number of these cases. I think I told you the other day about the Campo mm-hmm. missionary. Mm-hmm. The missionary with the Campo, this was before there were oral contraceptives on the market or any publicity about them that I'd heard of at least. And uh, that's about Bohemia. If I remember correctly, it has to be taken. It's best taken immediately after giving, giving birth. That's what the wo- I met a woman who was, whose husband was running a very large cattle ranch in the jungle, a very large fundo where they made cattle, they made, they made cattle. They had cattle, they had, they raised uh, pigs and they raised sugar cane and they had a distillery for making a guardiente. They had, it was a big outfit with a lot of money behind it. And she, her, she and her husband ran it. Well, she told me that when she was very, very young, she got married, I think she was 14, which is not unusual, and she went to live with her husband on his property in Campa country. Campa's a great tribe. They're great warriors, great trackers, very lively people and smart. And uh, she was, she had a child <laughs> very shortly after the marriage, I think nine months and two days or something. And uh, she had a very difficult birth. Of course, she'd never been in the jungle before, for one thing. She was reacting rather badly to the climate. And, and uh, the Indian midwife who attended her said, you can't have another child for three years because you'll die if you do. There were no doctors, of course. And uh, she said, but I can't leave my husband. I don't want to leave my husband. She said, why should you leave your husband? We'll give you some medicine. So they did. And the medicine, that particular medicine, is one that, to my mind, is a magnificent example of freedom for freeing women. It stops menstruation for three years without any evil effects at all. And uh, at the end of those three years, you just don't menstruate. It brings about an artificial menopause, but no menopause symptoms. And uh, so then, uh, at the end of the three years, she got pregnant almost immediately and then she had in rapid succession I think it was in 10 years she had 11 children so now with a total of around a dozen she decided that was enough <laughs> and she took the same herb again and she, she had been taking it every 3 years since and she was at the time I met her 49, she said she didn't think she was going to have to take it again because she thought she would probably have menopause. And uh, But she took it every three years. The children, every one of the 12, was alive and healthy. And uh, they, have, they were grown up by now. And they had their own families. And her daughters and daughter-in-laws controlled it their fertility in the same way, had children when they wanted them. So what is the, the plant is a desmodium. Now, there are four species I know of. There's de- desmodium canum is the one I know best. Desmodium... Is I, I can't remember... The canna is the one, uh, oh yes, Ascendants and Axillari. And then there's one other. Well, I don't know which of the species, I'm not certain which of the species it is, but because I've since learned that the Campa, beside the Campa, the, 
Yaguas, Shipibos, Conibos, and Kokama all say this is good stuff and they use it. Yes, there is, but I, that's one of the sedges I had, that the, that uh, we have finally decided the active principle is cause, or is the origin, the active principle is a fungus that grows in the plant, and it's practically impossible to determine unless you have are a member of the tribe and have grown that, they've handed it down from generation to generation, a plot of abortifacients, a plot of uh, those which are supposed to enhance fertility, a plot which eases childhood, and believe me, that one's great. Because I had a friend who was a school, school teacher. I met her in a little village I stopped at, and she was teaching a Shipibo village and she took this is my she was my first link with the Shipibo tribe they're the ones who make that beautiful those beautiful textiles you showed last night mm-hmm. and uh, she the, I went to stay with her at the tribe and got to be great chums with the, all the Indians I recorded their singing which is beautiful and one of the songs I love best, it's ve- the women's songs are very plaintive and uh, haunting. A- a- very high, pure voices, but beautifully flexible and very true and very soft. And this one song was particularly moving. It was the kind of thing you kept going through your head. And I fi- it's very hard to get them interpreted because they're sung in an archaic language. And I finally found somebody who had interpreted it. And what they were saying was, let us gals have a few drinks. <laughs> and I, and that, then that's smarter than it sounds. Because at Fiestas, I learned, when they sing that song, Pappy can't have a drink. The men have to stop drinking when the women start, when the women drink. They never drink very much. They're too conscious of their children and taking care of them, and usually they're nursing one or two. And uh, so they, uh, but when they, so when things are getting a little rough, very often they will sing this song and they'll have a bit of masato, and the men just have to sit there. Well, uh, she had gone. This, I went back to visit two years later because I had become great chums with them, especially after they discovered braziers. I had wa- done my washing and hung it on the line, and a boat came along. I, that, I didn't have my own boat then, and I was... Uh, one came along, a pecky pecky that would take... Uh, it was a collective that takes people aboard. They sort of worked like buses on the river and I had to hurry to catch it and I had just got in when some of these beautiful little women came running yelling and they were running down holding up a brazier that I'd left behind and then they also held up some of their they'd copied it they had made them all and the whole community now all the Shipibos look a lot better <laughs> They do, especially after they get to be about 30. <laughs> and uh, so I had... Be- yes? Question, Pat? Yes. Back to the, uh, the birth control methods. Um, do you know if there are uh, fewer uh, negative side effects? There don't seem to be any. Yes. According to my informants, there are none. Zero. I haven't heard of any side effects. I tried very hard to find some. I'm told there are none. What? Menopause. Uh, well, yes, I, I, 
She told me that her sister had been having a bad menopause, and she gave her this same thing. And uh, it, it, it took her through menopause. I know one that's very good for menopause. It's not a contraceptive. But there is one for any, any dysmenorrhea. I have given it, I gave it to the maid, a little girl who had very severe cramps and hemorrhaging. I fixed her up in, in a day or so. And then I was stay, the, the people I was staying with, Lillis had, uh, was going through menopause and having a bad time with the hot flashes and all that, uh, and have, and hemorrhaging. And I gave her, suggested she try it. I'd planted it in her garden a couple of years before when I was there. And, because they had pretty flowers. And she took it. What is it? Could you spell that? It's an iris. It's called, they call it Yawar Piri Piri. Yawar means blood, and piri piri means piri piri, but uh, but this is not a sedge; it's an iris. It's an iridaceae, and it is. What is it? I can't think of the genus just at the moment. I'll think of it in about five minutes. Drop the penny, and I get the answer. Yes, you take the bulb, and you can grind it, just grind it up in water raw, but more often you boil it a little while. And that that does the trick. It seems to regulate menstru- menstruation, whether it's menopause or not. And they drink it just one time? A couple of times, maybe. Maybe, two, maybe for two days. It doesn't seem to be toxic in any way. I, there haven't been any tests done on it. But I've never heard of anyone having any bad effect. Karen, have you brought any of these plants over? That you <laughs> that? I, I think that the Chanka Piedra, is it? Oh, yes, that. I think we have that. Yeah, I think you can get that. And what did you put on your knee? Kapinuri. Kapinuri, we have Pradisia that. Pradisia nitida. And I would have to have the full printout in front of me, but these are precisely the same plants that we're involved in. The piri piris, and Nicole has mentioned that there are contraceptive ones, abortifacients, and so forth. You can't tell so which are which. There's also a hallucinogen. Oh, yes. And Chikoro. Chikoro piri piri. And um, I've made great effort to get that one, but not wanting to induce an abortion. I, now that I have it, I'm not sure what to do with well, it. Well, it's a different... I think it's a... F- I, I don't think it's corombosis. Well, I, I don't know. They look... I'll, like I'll check it. I have it in my files. I have three species of piri piri, and they basically... The only way in which they're different is they're little, middle-sized, and big before they stop growing. But otherwise... I can't tell them apart, and they're chemically Nobody very can. complex. I know. Yeah. No, but the, the kinds of plants that I gave up on those about, because of this. Because of. Because of the fact that is apparently not a, there is no change, no difference in the genus, or the species, and there's not a it's not a variety, it's some external influence such as a fungus. A fungus. Well, so conceivably, because they are different uh, chemically. someone could do a project where you grew out an uninfected strain and then attempted to infect it yes. with these various but, well, you, strains. You'd have, to get the, uh, you'd have to get the originals from the Shibibos, though. You see, throughout history, you will go to any village and you will see little round plots, only about that big round usually in a village, uh, a pity pity, and they they one will be oh they'll be for any one of the of the twenty two uses that I know of and probably some more. Running from broken bones and I told you about the ones you wash your pa- husband's pants with, so they'll be impotent with another woman, and. Uh, the ones for hunting they'll make you a good hunter. You rub them on your blowgun. You'll never miss your shot, that sort of thing, which I don't really think we have much uh, 
need for in our civilization. What is the name of the grass that is used on the eyes? That's Paspalum conjugatum. P-A-S-P-A-L-U-M C-O-N-J-U-G-A-T-U-M It's a graminea. This family, the Graminea, have many, many uh, indoles and growth hormones, and it seems to be a family loaded with stuff. It's very interesting. Very interesting. There is another grass that the Shipibos say has saved more lives. You see, the Shipibos have some rather interesting customs. If a woman is caught with a man who is not her husband, in a compromising situation why everybody drops everything and there's a big fiesta <laughs> and uh, the woman is not punished but the man has to be severely punished because it's his fault I am in favor of this civilization <laughs> and And uh, he is uh, at the fiesta. Everybody gets very drunk. And then the husband has a special knife for this. Every Shipibo man wears one on a string. It's called a wishati. And uh, it's a knife with a little handle that is a peculiar shape. And a curved blade is cut out of an old machete. And it's only about so, the blade's only about so long and about as wide as my finger. And the, me the, the culprit, the seducer, gets a cut across the back of his neck. And he bleeds profusely. It's a deep cut. And, of course, some of them are proudly <laughs> scarred from the fact of the way. And he would, they say he would bleed to death, but for this grass, and I don't remember the scientific name, they call it Canyon... Canya Negra. It. I have it. I have it in my notes. I have it. I took. I only got it identified by Sydney. I had been trying for twelve years to get that one identified. And nobody knew it. It looks like sugar cane, and it's purple, but it isn't quite sugar cane, and it's not sweet, and it will stop bleeding. It's a hemostatic, applied locally, and uh, it is. It's wonderful stuff. And he says that's that all the men in the de tribe would practically have bled to death if it hadn't been for that grass. Because they always keep, have it growing nearby. And as I, I was saying, the woman never gets punished. Well, she does, it, does only if the other wife decides to take a hand in it. The betrayed wife. And then they have a hair pulling contest. I want... I was lucky enough to see one. Unfortunately, I didn't have my camera out at the time. And uh, it was back in the boat. And these two women, the, the women cut their hair straight across here, down here, and then long in the back. is straight and thick and very shiny and beautifully kept. And these two women had each other by the hair, and their heads were down. They looked like fighting elk. And their heads were down. And they weren't going this way. They just were pulling steadily and they're walking around in a circle. It seemed to be a sort of ritual. And everybody was standing around. And they were all laughing. And the women were furious. <laughs> and finally they broke it up. But for about five minutes while I was there, they were pulling. <laughs> they didn't pull it out. I don't quite understand it, but it was very interesting to see and extremely funny. <laughs> it's a whole plant. It's a weed that grows about so high. That you use root, leaf, stems, and fruit and flowers. It has it it has these little burrs that stick to you. That's why that's they say why it's called Amor Seco. It loves to stick dr to dry things, but. Uh, there is the contraceptive, and I think that's a rather nice name for one. 
Th there's a Desmodium in India that contains DMT, Desmodium pucellum. It's a, it's a very big roots. genus. Yeah, it's a big genus. The hitchhiker plant in Hawaii is a weedy Desmodium. You may have it there. It may be one of them. I know, when I think how much time I've spent trying to eradicate it, there's a certain irony. But I have dentists go to work on it. Yes, right. <laughs> <coughs> Nicole, uh, what do you think about the future of the Amazon? Well, I think that if we can only get the word around, there's money to be made by doing other things than cutting it down and burning it, then... Some of it may be saved. So extractive foresting is the thing to make people aware of. I think it's essential. Because as it is, a, well, you, you know the statistics as well as I do, if not better, and that one species is disappearing a day. Not necessarily a plant species, but a species of something. And... These medicinals are disappearing. Did you? <laughs> you saw everybody wiggles a hand. I think they mean me. Yes? You can't get a patent on a plant. So it's, it's to no advantage of any kind of drug company. They, there's not an, well, also, uh, some of them are too efficient. For example, the, the ones for arthritis that rarely cure it. Who wants arthritis cured? Certainly not the pharmaceutical houses. Uh, what was the name of that herb that cured the arthritis? It's not a herb, it's the bark of a tree. It's a, a Unanopsis. I've forgotten the species. There aren't very many. It's not a big genus. But I have it. It's a Rubiaceae. And that's the one that is also effective, very effective for di controlling diabetes. To everybody's surprise, it's not so touted for that. And uh, so now I know half a dozen people who are using it for diabetes. So, uh, I have a, an idea that this is like the uña de gato and tabibuya, the, which is the paudarco. Mm -hmm. They are things that, uh, well, they work entirely by stimulating and restoring the immune system, the autoimmune system. They will, they're a, I found them a tremendous help when I get any infection. There are a number of infections that are not easily treated with antibiotics. And I found that taking that and the antibiotic, neat. And uh, they're now trying to get it, trying to get somebody to try it for AIDS because that is the obvious. I think it's the obvious remedy. How dark? Huh? How dark? Well, any of those... Tababuya. Tabib... Uh, Pau Darko is a Tababuya. Right. And that is also... That's... In Achilles, it's known only as a cure for diabetes. And the owner of the Johnson Motor franchise for all of Peru, the outboard motors, is, was uh, so helped by it that he keeps it in his desk in all stores or in the manager's desk for, to be given to anybody because he feels he's so indebted to it for what it's done for him. You know, a, a lot of the Pau de Arco coming out of the Amazon is now thought to be phony. I wouldn't be at all surprised. Since nobody up here knows what it looks like. 
and they you're do. getting fancy prices for this powdered bark, it, they can powder up anything. So immediately, once something is discovered yes. that's effective, then fraud becomes oh, yes. a possibility. Oh, so, yes. Well, look at the Sangre de Grado. Even Seems. I was fooled by one. It foamed like the proper one. They put detergent in it. They get the sap of any... Lots of trees have sap the color of blood, of sort of old blood, dark red. And so they put a little detergent in it because... If you do this with um, with Sangha de Grado, the marvelous healing and hemostatic agent, because it does definitely speed regeneration of healthy tissue. And uh, then it will foam if you do that. Okay, take any old tree sap and put a little, a little bit of any kind of detergent in it and bingo, you got it. There's no substitute for growing your own because then you know what you have. Your trees are about ready to be milked, aren't they? Yes, we have Sangre de Grado trees in Hawaii and we're propagating it furiously. It's a wonderful, fast-growing tree. I know, it's a Croton pretty tree, Lechleri. too. Do you, do you sell seeds and, and cuttings from things? Is that part of what to d yes, when we can. I mean, our collections are small, but every plant that we have, we're trying to get cuttings off of. Uh, it's tricky for a 501c3 to make a lot of profit out of its business ventures. Uh, some of you may know Daniel and Ellen's business. Uh, their catalogs have been around. We are uh, wholesalers to them, as are many other companies. And we want to spread this stuff out, get it to other botanical gardens in the Hawaiian Islands and other places, because what if the volcano were to blow up and wipe out our scene? Then all this would be shot. So it is important to spread the stuff uh, around. Most of the plants that we have have not been studied at all the way they should. I mean, we have plants for impotence, baldness, kidney stones, diabetes. What are, what's the one for baldness? It's, I don't know th what the n Indians call it. The scientific name is Scoparia. It's a Scoparia. It's a Scoparia. I have some Scoparias I don't remember what for. It, I think it's Scoparia dulces. It's Scoparia dulces, yes. That is also... I have it. But it's not for... I haven't got it for Harry. As a matter of fact, I've... I've wondered about that. The, the retorters maintain that Bixal... No, uh... Bixalana? Not Bixalana, but, uh... That's a Choti. Yes. Uh, the Wito, you know, the black stuff that paints your skin, they use to paint their skins oh, black, yeah, uh -huh. will grow hair. But uh, I have never seen a bald Indian. Bald Indians and fat Indians seem not to be genetically possible. So I have, I'm a little dubious about the things that are supposed to keep you slim and elegant. <laughs> or fine and hairy. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'm very dubious about most things and it takes forever to establish a thing well enough for me to put it in my notes and a frightful lot of work. Yes, yeah, some of these things you try and you sort of realize that it lies in a domain of language and expectation and that something you define as unpleasant, they might define as pleasant and worthwhile. For instance, they have a plant that after you've carried your backpack along the trail all day long, they say that your muscles are stiffening up. So they have this plant that's like a nettle. Yeah, well, they are nettles. They're just ordinary nettles. Yes, they pat all over. And they use them. And they urge you to all do this. To, all the Indians swear by it. Why should you do this? What a terrible idea. You know? I think so, too, and they all <laughs> use it. I've had my berries, at the end of the day, always just beat themselves with nettles. And they say it feels great. <laughs> and there are also, you probably encountered this, Nicole, 
there is this concept of a culture-specific disease, and there are a lot of these in the Amazon, and a lot are cured by ayahuasqueros. Uh, I can't remember the term. You probably know it, Nicole, but when your luck goes off. Oh, yeah. I, I was at Ivory, Ivory. I thought it meant I smelled bad, but it didn't. It meant I'd been having a lot of bad luck. Everything went wrong. And mal, mal aire. Mal aire. And that's a disease. You have a problem. Oh, susto. 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 susto is interesting, too. Susto is fear. You get sick from us if you're badly startled. And babies especially are susceptible to this. Give a baby a bad scare and you'll get sick. Well, maybe... They, do they do that in our civilization? Not really. So you don't... Get a chill. Huh? They, well, get a chill. Some people think that if you get a chill, it, that you'll get sick from it. Similar sort of shock, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they recognize a lot of psychological states as being the cause of illness. Depression or... You don't see much of that. In fact, remarkably few neuroses are vis notable. Well, this is, this is, I think, is the legacy of shamanism. I do too. That where shamanism is a healthy institution, neurosis is virtually unknown. You do see an occasional psychosis. But that could be a <laughs> genetic <laughs> it predisposition. It can also be through injury. True, true. Yes, serious psychosis seems to arise from a different uh, set of causes. But neurotic activity is and people suppress people it's very learn, rare it is rare well uh, so is psychosis but uh, the truly chakra is supposed to make you nuts is that the guy with the beard who comes no he's one of his feet on backwards oh yeah they have all these demons that they fear one I've seen says he had he knew a truly chakra saw him quite often I gather with other friends I wouldn't put a past on Christina <laughs> He's a sculptor, magnificent. He's come to live in the States. His work's superb. It's frightfully interesting. Augustine Rivas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there are people here who know him. He has quite a reputation. Pat? Yes, uh, that was a question I was saving for the Chakramiris. About what? I understand that uh, neuroses <coughs> and Well, yes, they're getting colds in the head, too. Are there any medicines that are being used in the way that we use psychoactive drugs? Ayahuasca. That's what it is. The, the reason psychosis and all this is increasing is simply that stress is increasing worldwide. And that's why they... I mean, just as they have got measles now and whooping cough, which are incidentally fatal there, because they have, don't have the immunities that we have developed. And um, they kill an awful lot of children unless they're vaccinated. The missionaries now, most missions, no matter what kind, vaccinate all the children they can get to because they want to save them. We were also talking um, previously about um, uh, the American or the Western pharmaceutical companies um, wanting to make profit, and yet there are outfits that, quote, are non-profit, like Direct TV, who distribute American... Um, I don't know products, any. ...like for measles, vaccination, that sort of thing. Oh, that sort of thing. Because that's not what they're for. That's not what pharmaceutical companies are for. They're out to make money. They're not out for... 
Well, you see, it would be possible, uh, you would think, for like a feminist collective to create a non-profit pharmaceutical company, concentrate on these drugs that relate to women and reproduction. This is the kind of political action that hasn't been tried yet. Everything is done old style, but I think there would be tremendous opportunities for And I think great support. Yeah. Nothing. No, botanical dimensions, which is far from that, is the closest thing. But you need, you know, somebody who's really intensely committed to getting these contraceptives out and as a political thing with no motivation or very little motivation to turn a profit, then uh, you could probably get somewhere. This abortion pill that's being developed in France, which is the pharmaceutical equivalent of one of these abortifacents, is obviously going to change the whole reproductive freedom argument. Much of the position of the right to life people just becomes irrelevant. All it means is that we're going to have one more illegal drug to worry about in this society, but one addressed not to psychoactivity, but bioactivity. Well, Terrence, the main problem is getting the plants from over there over here. No. No, the development, testing, and satisfying of the government. Well, who needs that if you just have a seed catalog and you're selling seeds to people? Well, well, who is going to grow them? But some you, of these things are very difficult. And you have to be but careful if, if you're going to interfere with the reproductive system. I mean, this is delicate stuff here. Mm -hmm. you, want, uh, you want to know that you're not going to have a negative fallout 20 or 30 years in the future. But getting the plants is not a problem. A $50,000 investment would get all of these plants back to Southern California in a greenhouse catalog. Wouldn't and keep the greenhouse long, though. No. <laughs> it would take $5 million to go from there to a product on the market freely available to women. It's the development, testing, and certification that is just fiendishly difficult because this these chemical companies, it's a big boy's game. Well, you know that most of the FDA people who are in big jobs with the FDA, important jobs, go on to very highly paid jobs with pharmaceutical houses. So what I'm looking at is sort of a small industry where people are encouraged to plant their own crops. Like well, uh, I would oh, be afraid of be that. Done. Yes, because how do you know they get the right stuff? You'd have to be very sure of that, because some s close relations are apt to be toxic. We, we had an idea that is still alive. It was not clear it was for botanical dimensions to do, but someone could do it, of what we called the botanical first aid kit. And what you would do is you would survey the entire world's known catalog of medicinal plants and out of that you would select a plant for migraine, a plant to cause abortion, a contraceptive, a hallucinogen, an antidiuretic, an antidysentery, say a 12 plants. And then you would grow these in a huge greenhouse and build little care packages of living plants that could be then sent to third world people and they would just grow these things in their dooryard. Most third world people have local, but you know, if the ayahuasca is prophylactic for malaria, you s distribute it in the kit throughout but the world. But isn't it supposed to be rather good for parasites too? Oh, it's proven for parasites. The malarial thing is more speculative. Well, that's a parasite. But you see, you're giving people a self-renewing pharmacy in their own backyard. Right, but even right here in the United States, there are all kinds of people who've given a few seeds or cuttings of something would...